Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Mr. Timothy Roberts to talk about the indie symbol movement going on right now across the world. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Bart. Yeah, very cool, man. We just met in Chicago, which was nice to meet you. And I uh, I think I briefly talked to her, but I, I kind of met your wife and your your baby daughter yes. and uh, at the, the, the symbol hang upstairs and all that, which uh, was super cool. I'm sure we'll Sure, we'll talk about that stuff and the the Chicago hang. Um, but yeah, c- can you quickly explain? Because there's Reverie Drum Co. Just give us your brands that you are operating as, just to kind of cue things up here. Yeah. So my uh, brief history is that I went to school for music, played professionally for a few years, and the life was not for me. I wanted something more steady, and I had always wanted to. Uh, I'd always wanted to build a snare drum, and so I had a little dip in my work, a few months where I wasn't traveling, wasn't doing any touring, and I decided to just order some parts and make a snare drum and see what happened. And I cannot remember a transition from doing that or saying I was going to try it to, okay, this is what I'm doing now for the foreseeable future. And so I started building custom drums in 2015 that morphed into making... percussion accessory products made out of recycled cymbals cool. which dove me into the world of bronze and before i knew it i was uh, a full-time cymbal smith and so I, I still make the drums i've got a couple employees that help me do that uh, and my my role is as a as a cymbal smith nice that's awesome which we will talk about all this stuff more but i'm always just curious because like it's Working with symbols and metal is just not something drums I kind of get. Like you order mm-hmm. something offline, you put the parts together, but symbol smithing is a different kind of beast that that takes some uh some work, which which we'll discuss. But mm-hmm. before we do this, I, a couple quick things I wanna I wanna say. Um first off, I want to give a Patreon shout out to Mr. Sean Meeks, M-E-E-K-S, who joined up at the upper tier on Patreon and uh he said he doesn't really have anything to promote. He just wants to support the show. And uh, I really appreciate it. He's been a fan of the podcast for a long time. So thank you to Sean for for helping out. It really it helps everything uh, to pay for all these little things here and there. So thanks to Sean. If you guys want to join Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash drum history podcast. And then, Tim, I want to mention uh, someone who connected us, actually, Rob Hart, who has been on the podcast before. Teacher, educator, great guy in San Francisco. Um he said he tried some of your symbols at round sound symbols mm-hmm. and was just blown away. So yeah, there's a Jason's great testimony spot. right there. Yeah. And then he sent me a, a pair of 14 a hat new beats. Some of the early new beats when they actually had a really thin top hat, it wasn't mm. just two chunky symbols. It was like one yeah. of the early models and he had me take them way down and, and we got to kind of chatting at that point and that's when he connected us. So that's awesome. All right, Tim. So, there is something going on in the in in the the you know the the atmosphere right now with symbol making. It is so popular. It's like a it's a revolution in the symbol world where people are doing it on their own. So you made a really cool outline, which we'll kind of follow along here. But uh, let's just start, man. Where do you want to begin? So to me, I would say it starts with Roberto Spizzacchino, and a lot of people would say that. Um, you you kind of have to go back one step prior and you know you've had people way more knowledgeable on the Zildjian brand and K Zildjian A Zildjian there's a whole history there which I think you actually have a, an episode literally devoted to that which I've listened to sure. yeah. um and just a brief recap is that you have a K Zildjian factory and then you have a member of the Zildjian family moving to the US and starting uh, another factory in the U.S., and then they compete with each other. And what happens is in the 70s, the K Zildjian factory shuts down, and the K Istanbul line was known for thinner symbols. A lot of jazz guys use those symbols. Uh, a lot of jazz guys use A's as well, but the K had uh, had a vibe that a lot of drummers really loved, and they were phased out in the late 70s. And during the 70s, you have this guy, Roberto Spizzacchino. He was a professional drummer. He started tinkering with cymbals. I believe it was in the 80s and started making his own cymbals. He was hired by the company UFIP as, a, as an R&D guy and was with them 
uh, for a time period. I don't know how many years. And then he left and started making his own symbols. And he was, from what I've read, he was inspired by the the K Istanbul line, and he wanted to make symbols in that vein. And I would, you know, I would venture to guess that, you know, in the eighties, you had a huge boom in the technology of recorded music and live music. It got way louder. You know, all of a sudden you had to have a symbol that had a bell that could cut through a stack. And so a Zildjian's were getting heavier in the eighties and the bells were getting super big and just really piercing sounds great for rock and roll. Uh, but a lot of people were, uh, we're, we're sad at the fact that the K, the K symbols were not continuing to be made. They were, they were out of production, and so they became rare. They were sought after collectibles, and so there was a real gap in the, a real chasm in the market of that kind of sound. Um, you can make an argument that Zildjian was making symbols for that, but it was, uh, it was a much smaller piece of their pie. And what yeah. they were really producing in the '80s, I, I modify a lot of symbols, and I see a ton of Zildjians from the '80s and the '90s come in, and I always cringe when I see them because they are just the way they're set up is they're set up to be loud, and then yeah. a lot of times people want them, you know, quiet and nuanced. Um, so you're shaving stuff off of those to yeah. get them. Yeah. Usually, just taking the weight way down, and you know they're still real loud. Uh, yeah, but. You know, no, obviously, no hate on those companies. It's it's just sounds to me. It's just sounds. You know, it's I I definitely have my preferences. Um, but one thing I really love about symbols and about music in general is that there's there's no one right answer, and there's you can always yeah. connect with a certain symbol. You know, there's arguments that you can make the argument that there's no bad sounding symbol, or you know, because because maybe someone likes it, and you know, it's not totally. bad for them. Um, so for me, I'm I'm super inspired by Spizzichino, and you know he really is like the godfather of this indie symbol smith movement. And you know his heyday, I think, was between uh, the years of like 1991 till his death, which was in 2011. Um, and during that phase, you know he had been making symbols, I believe, for around a decade before that. Worked for UFIP, and in that decade when he was really at his prime, making you know some really incredible symbols was when you had a lot of other symbol smiths start to come in and you have what I would call like the first wave of indie makers that come after Spizzichino. Um, a lot of those guys are still making incredible symbols today. I've got my mm. little lists here. I could read off a few names, but uh, sure. we got Mike Skiba, Craig Lordson, uh, Steve Hubbock, Matt Nolan, who we both, you know, hung out with yep. in Chicago. Yep. Um, we got Matt Bettis, Michael Peisty. Uh, there's really, uh, there's probably a couple other names in that list, but those were the guys that 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 kind of took inspiration from Spiz and started doing it. And and you know, so it starts with one, it goes to you know ten, and then there's a second wave, which is kind of the 2010s to now, and that number of ten independent symbol smiths has moved now to probably twenty or thirty. There's a whole nother batch of guys that are currently just working on their technique and getting their stuff together. So in the coming years that, you know, it's going to be an exponential growth kind of thing in this yeah. symbol smithing movement. And I'm super happy I get to be a part of it, you know? Totally. And and just to kind of, uh, so this there there is an incredible short four and a half minute documentary mm -hmm. that uh, Alex Healy created about Spizzichino. Um, that that I'll put in the description for people to watch. But um, Roberto Spizzichino, he he even said in it, there's there's nothing wrong with the big brands. He said they're just they're all beautiful. And he likes the ugly sounds. Yeah. Where I think ugly is kind of a subjective term where it's not maybe the the crystal clean, you know, perfect sound of like a Zildjian, a Peisty, a Minol, where you come to expect that. Right. He he he, and 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 you have some cool actually videos of you modifying a Spizzichino uh, yeah. symbol on your YouTube channel, which I'm sure people are like, "Dude, what are you doing?" Yeah, but I definitely you, have a couple people that are like not happy that I did that, but overall, I think it's kind of an interesting. It's interesting cool, thing. and yeah, and I mean, it's it it just gives it new life, and maybe if that that sound, if it's a little too far out of the the, the norm of what people expect, why not modify it a little bit? Mm -hmm. But um. 
So he said those big brands are really, you know, there's nothing wrong with them, obviously. But another interesting thought, too, is that, like, there's a lot of brands who maybe were like, there's like the uh, the Bosphorus and the Istanbul Mehmets. There's the brands that kind of like started off smaller and then got a little bigger. And then you kind of get out of the indie symbol yep. phase and then you get bigger. Right. Where it's like an evolution. Like, I wonder if if some of these, you know, maybe you and these other guys will hit a level of now they're a little bit bigger and they're no longer in the indie category. And it's just it's like a band. Right. You know? Right. Like, exactly. Yeah. They're no longer indie. They're now mainstream. So it's just it's really neat to see how it all works and and grows. And and I, I think you said this before, but just to clarify, there's a lot of people, guys, right. girls, people we talk about. We will we cannot mention every single name. Some of them we've we've you know them I know them uh, from the drum shows but there's a lot of people so if we don't mention either you as a builder if you're listening or someone um, who you know you may know it's just because there's so many people you right. know just to kind of clarify that there's a lot yeah and I would I, I will say like what you mentioned Bos- Bosphorus that was actually a company that to me in my personal musical journey was a stepping stone towards what I'm doing now because you know they're a smaller company they're a Turkish company. They're making symbols a little bit more in the vein of that old K kind of thinner, yeah. jazzier kind of sound. Um, I started out, I was all Sabian. You know, my favorite drummer played Sabian. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I listened to Rush all the time and I would just play along to Neil Peart and just, I had my drums set up like him. And, yep. you know, I that happened. And then college was what introduced me into jazz. And then at the same time, I kind of, I discovered Bosphorus. I, dis- I discovered um, Agop, some of these other smaller companies sure. that were that actually, I would say, you know, took inspiration from, in a lot of ways, the movement that Spizzichino started, and also the jazz drummers that were just demanding this kind of sound. They they wanted to go back to this, harken back to this, you know, older time when you know you could get a twenty two inch ride. That was twenty four hundred grams. It wasn't thirty five hundred grams with a huge profile and a massive <laughs> bell. You know, yeah. they, they wanted that, and so it's partly the drummer and what the the drummer and the musicians are are asking for. But it's also partly, you know, I would say due to to the influence of of Spizzichino, You know, yeah, that's the tale as old as time when it comes to symbols. Is like Gene Krupa going to Zildjian and saying, "I need this thinner," or "I need this." A bigger symbol. I need this for this. It's it's what the drummer wants, and it's the symbol smith's job to make it work for them. Yes, uh, which is really really cool. So yeah. Um. All right. That's a great explanation. So there's a couple. There's there's the early wave. There's the first wave. There's the second wave, and there's the third wave of people doing it now. Which just to touch on the third wave. So you by that you mean there's people who are like getting their little like blanks and working on learning how to do it. Yes. And, Coming up. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And it's, you know, a lot of us guys get started by modifying symbols. I probably modified, I, I modified well over 500 symbols before I ever touched a blank. Wow. So I started a company that, and my original goal, mainly because I didn't think it was possible to make a symbol from scratch. It was like, you know, I, I, I had to spend all of my mental and physical energy just to figure out how to build a lathe. And so when I got my lathe, it was like, okay, I'm going to modify symbols. And so I offered it. I put it up on my website, started having people send me stuff, and I got my technique and learned by doing it and also being able to just see almost every type of symbol that was on the market before I ever you know, grabbed a, a, a raw bronze blank to start from scratch and shaping that thing. And mm. a, a lot of us guys got started in that way. Like, uh, I actually have a picture of my on my phone from when I interviewed Matt Nolan on my podcast. Yes. And it was like of his very first project where he was he had cut out like the Batman insignia out of a symbol. And it was oh, just cool. some, some crappy symbol he got and he he did that. That was his first mod and then that led to more people sending him stuff and saying, "Can you make this weird thing?" And it kind of snowballs. You get you get into it and then you start to realize, "Okay, it's more possible than I thought." to yeah. change the sound of this instrument. And then you start asking the questions of what if I have a lathe? What would it take to get a lathe? What would it take to, you know, build an anvil and start making my own hammers? And and then before you know it, you're there. Like it really does yeah. kind of capture you if you if you have the mind for it. This week's episode is brought to you by GM Designs Custom Symbols. GM Designs is not your typical symbol company. 
They create symbols that you won't see anywhere else. Things such as B20 finger symbols, a B20 triangle, a multi-bell symbol, and very recently they created the largest bell ever on a symbol at 10 inches. In addition to creating their own original symbols, they also take old ideas that are no longer in production, revise them, and make them available again. Also, recently, Pat Mastoletto, formerly of King Crimson, was using a GMD uh, multi-bell symbol, which is super cool. Whether you're a studio musician, a touring professional, or a passionate beginner, GM Designs offers a diverse selection of symbols to cater to your musical needs. Visit their website to explore their gallery of products, store links, and latest features at gmdsymbols.com. That's gmdsymbols.com. It's not supposed to be easy where everyone can just go out and be like, I'm going to start making symbols. There has to be like, it's especially again, you're working with metal. It's kind of dangerous, like lathing. Yeah. It's not like something you just do. You take lightly and just go out and start doing this. And it's loud. And you need like, you know, the, the right setup for it. So tons of uh, uh, respiratory uh, dangers. There's, sure. you know, I mean, I've I've cut my hand on sharp edges of symbols that were spinning at 400 RPM on my lathe more times than I can Man. count. You know, that, yeah. and and it's a miracle I still have all of my fingers and and I'm I'm relatively intact after just you know I didn't <laughs> yeah. have anyone training me in the beginning. It was just it was just figuring it out as I went. And um, yeah, the the age that we're in now, which is what's cool in this, you know, to call it like a third wave kind of thing. The second wave, which I would, you know, I'm, I'm technically, you know, I'm. By the way, I'm, I'm the one, only one who's actually said these things about waves. There's no one who's actually designated. There's a first and second and third wave. <laughs> yeah. I just kind of pulled this out of my butt. Hopefully, it works. Um, sure. But I, you know, I'm in the second wave. You know, having started my company in 2015, and I've got some years under my belt, yeah. and some symbols under my belt. And yep. for the big, for the first, you know, two three years, I had no instruction at all i was modifying symbols doing things the hard way and then you know you hit like 2019 2020 and you start to have a trickle of some of the makers saying well maybe we should teach this art form so i have to give a huge shout out to dave collingwood who's a really good buddy of mine um who has a patreon where you can literally go to him with zero training zero know-how about how to do it and he'll teach you from square one Wow. What do you need to do? What do you need to look out for? What What do you need to order to make your lathe? You know, and and it, he actually helped me in a lot of ways, just kind of clear away some of the pitfalls and get me to the point where I was just working more efficiently. So a lot of the guys in this third wave, the reason we're seeing a big boom is because there are people out there training other yeah. people and, and kind of opening up things a little bit where it has been a really closed community. Uh, mainly because of, like you said, how hard it is. It's it's incredibly difficult to get into this thing. It's incredibly dangerous. And if you don't have someone teaching you, it can be very daunting to try to step into it. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think partly because there's a desire in the market for these kinds of symbols, there's actually room for all of the people that are that are offering their their symbols now. I can make a living as a full time independent symbol smith uh, in today's day and age, which is crazy. Like that yeah. wasn't the case before social media hit and I can get on this little crazy black box and just post, Hey, I made a symbol and then sell it and feed my family. You know, that, that wasn't the case. So um, seriously, that's, yeah. you know, obviously I, I, we could sit here and talk about all the dangers of social media all, <laughs> all we want, but that's like yeah. a real plus to it. And so that's another it, reason totally. why we have such a growth in this, uh, this movement. Yes, absolutely. And YouTube, which I think I said it before, but you mentioned your podcast, um, which you can I'm, I'm assuming you can listen everywhere. But there's mm -hmm. also uh, it's on your YouTube channel, Reverie, R-E-V-E-R-I-E -E -E, drums. You've got Ray Byrne. You've got a lot of people who have been on this the show and are friends of sh the show. Ray was the first person ever sponsor the podcast. And he really? sent me some symbols oh. in exchange for some ads. So uh, Nikki Moon, Paul Francis, you've got some some great stuff on there. So everyone check that out. But um You've, I'm looking at your outline. As for the symbols themselves, you say understanding the symbol construction is very important for a smith, obviously, but the musicians slash drummers who are looking to find their sound should know that as well. So explain mm -hmm. that a little bit, like the construction of it. I'm always interested on in how the hammering affects things and the lathing affects things and how that, you know, the weight, what that translates to me as the consumer, uh, how that all works. Yeah. And it's it's confusing 
because it's it's very confusing and it's and, and it's very hard to like concisely put it all in one little box yeah. so that you understand it all and and I think like a lot of us I got into symbol smithing because I was dissatisfied with what I could find in the market. I didn't feel like the sound I had in my head was being offered anywhere and then also a healthy dose of being an insane person you know, you have that combination and then you start pursuing, okay, well, what if, what if I just tried to make this myself? Um, and as I, through the years of modifying symbols and then starting to make them, I really started to have, it was like a very slow process that happened over the course of years of this very basic level of understanding of, okay, I see what's happening. I see how you can utilize different specs uh, different ways of constructing a symbol to get the kind of sound you want. Yeah. And oftentimes when people send me mods, you know, there's a big element of of training people what to look for. If you have a symbol and you think there might be a treasure inside that symbol that you kind of think is meh, uh, what do you look for to be able to give you the best possible answer as to whether or not you can get that out of the symbol, get something that's really beautiful out of that symbol that you will really love and connect with. So sure. um, I'm going to talk about a phrase that I will rip straight from Dave Collingwood. So all credit goes to Dave here. He has a thing that he says that shape is sound. So this mm. to me kind of encompasses everything. And I'm going to take what he says. He kind of just leaves it there. He talks about it in his, in his Patreon stuff, but I've taken that and sort of run with it in a way to help me because I'm a really simple person. I'm not a, I'm not, I don't consider myself super smart. Uh, I'm a simple guy. I need things to be boiled down into their utmost basic level for me to understand. I feel the same way about and me. I th- and I think a lot of people are like that and, and it's, yeah. it's, it's great. And I mean, even just to take a little, uh, you know, as a side note, I've noticed in the, in the last couple of years, all of my favorite drummers that are on an unbelievable level of technical prowess and mastery. If you listen to them talk about what they practice, almost always they're like, I practice the basics. Yeah. I practice my single stroke roles. And you're like, okay, when I listen to you play in your band, you know, I'm hearing the most insane music and, and, and unbelievable chops, uh, musicality interaction with the other, like you're saying you work on your single strokes and they're like, yes, I work on my single strokes. And so fundamentals. The fundamentals. So in with symbols, you know, and symbol smithing in particular, the fundamentals are huge. So back to shape is sound. Shape is sound. Um, if you can have a basic level of understanding of the shape of a symbol, you can be better equipped to know what it is you want to look for to get the sound you have in your head. So I'm going to just read this off because I listed, uh, I think yep. it's like six or seven things. Uh, so I, I have to, w- there's a little bit of stretching with these things. So just go with me here. And, you know, if you have any questions, if nothing's clear, you know, if yeah, something's yeah. not clear, just just let me know. So obviously, really basic, we have the overall diameter of the symbol. Is it six inches? Is it 22 inches? Okay, that's a shape, right? Uh, a certain shape. Obviously, sure. the smaller we have, the higher the pitch is, the bigger we have, the lower the pitch is. So broad strokes, that's what we have. Then we have what's called the profile. And if you look at the side of a symbol, you know, you're looking at how it curves, you know, you've got the bell, how it's shaped, how it curves, and you've got the body and how it curves and the varying degrees to which it curves is the profile. And so we can manipulate as symbol smiths. We can manipulate the sound, uh, in a massive way, just by how that thing is shaped. Mm. Um, and same with the bell, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, we have the shape of the thickness. So, so this, the shape here, is it, is it like this? Is it like this? You know, that's going to be obviously the thinner it is, the lower the pitch, the thicker it is, the higher the pitch. And so you start to see when you add just one or two or three elements, there's a lot there that you can adjust the different variables and get different sounds. So what if you combined a very big symbol, you know, relatively it's got a low pitch with, uh, so a big symbol with a thick weight or or a, a, a high degree of thickness which is a higher pitch. So you've got low pitch, high pitch together, and it kind of balances in a certain way. Hmm, yeah. If you get a very big symbol and you have it be very thin, you've got low stacked on top of low, and you've got this super growly, 
very, you know, some a symbol with a very low fundamental, probably incredibly washy, you know, and then you've got the profile. Now the profile, like the 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 more it curves, this is all super general, but the more it curves, the higher the pitch. So now we okay. have okay, so now say we have a 20 inch symbol. Okay. 20 inch is very common. Okay, we want a 20 inch symbol that is going to be very thin because we want it to be light and responsive. But we also don't want it to be muddy. What do we do? We get that 20 inch symbol and we hammer it into a taller shape. So we're raising the pitch because of the tall shape, but because of the th- the thickness, the thin weight, we have a lower fundamental there. So we're then mm. starting to design our symbol in a way that we can have a really light responsive symbol, but it has a high enough pitch to the stick articulation that it can have some clarity and it's just it's not just muddy. I was going to say, so the opposite of mud would be clarity and yes. just each hit. So if so mud though would just be each hit is not very well defined it's just kind of yeah and the symbol is activating and all the overtones are activating to a point where they just overtake the clarity you have on your stick we're talking about a ride too obviously crashes are a different thing um and so you know to take the reverse point before i keep moving on the reverse point is like okay we want to have a very low fundamental and a flat shape right we don't want this super umbrella shaped symbol we want a flatter shape so maybe we need more weight with a flatter shape. So that flatter shape is going to give us a lower fundamental, but the the uh, the heavier weight on the symbol is going to give us enough clarity because there's just, there's going to be enough material there so that when you hit the stick, you're going to hear the stick. And yeah. then there's, there'll, yeah. there'll be this really low growly wash underneath it. But um, you can't put more weight back on a symbol, you right? You can't. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. I was like, wait a minute. That seems right. like a dumb question. I probably should I'll say that in a, in a different way. So it's like design your symbol to have more weight on it and then Got just it. hammer it into a lower shape, you know? Yeah. So, and then, it, so that's just, that's just three of those, uh, of the, of these elements. I've got a, yeah. a few more, so I, I, yeah. I don't want it to get too complicated, but no, go for it. The yeah, point yeah. of those taking those three and talking about them is, is just to say that it's kind of like a mixing engineer sitting behind a, um, you know, you got a band mix engineer. You're you're sitting there with the faders and you're mm-hmm. mixing in certain things. Except with symbol making, if you turn up one fader, it's going to affect all the other faders in a way. So sure, it's like a mix between being a mix engineer and being, uh, you know, and tuning a drum head, right? Because you, exactly. you turn one lug, it's it's affecting the other lugs around the drum. So yes. um, the next one I have is taper. Taper is just where that thickness is located. So typically you will taper your cymbal out towards the edge. So it gets thinner as it gets out towards the edge. Now, what you can do there is if you want a cymbal, you know, we'll put aside the other factors. Say you want a cymbal that has a really nice softer feel and it opens up quickly with a crash, but it has a lot of stick definition. You can just taper the outer two or three inches real thin and then leave more weight up higher on the symbol. So then, you know, that weight is going to give you the stick clarity you want, but but because it's thinning to the edge, you can crash on it and it will respond really quick. Cool. So yeah. that's taper. Um, I like to say, I don't, I haven't heard any other symbol smiths say this, but I like to talk about topography. So just kind of like the, the peaks and the troughs sure. and the, all that like kind of stuff. Like a map, yep. you know, so you got symbols that are smooth. Think of like a um, an A custom projection crash, right? If you were to zoom in to that, it's going to be relative, relatively, it's going to have minimal topography. It's going to be pretty flat. The lathing is going to be pretty shallow and pretty close together. And what that allows for is for the sound to propagate up and down the symbol quickly and easily. Okay, so the sound is traveling, and when there's more hammering, it it's it's going up and down and through the hammer, the the hammer hits and everything. But right, a custom smooth, you don't really see much hammering. It's just whoo, it going feels right it's it. flat, and so those it's, it. you know it's it's just able to shoot off the edge like water. Whereas if you have you know I'm trying to think of, I mean if you look at like um, the. Uh, the agop line of like the dark dry where they just have these massive machine hammering divots mm-hmm. you know you've created this really crazy topography in one sense you're you're sort of drying up 
what I call the spread or the sustain of the of the sound. You're giving Got it a drier it. sound. It, the, 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 that sound, the sound waves can't propagate up and down as easily, so it's going to translate into a bit of a drier sound. Cool. With with a cymbal like a Spizzichino ride, like I had a ride in. You, you mentioned like the Spizzichino ride that I modified. You know, it has this balance of topography smoothness. And topography also relates to the lathing. How deep does the lathe groove go? How wide is it? You know, if you go with a wider separation between those grooves and you go deeper, that's also creating that topography. So, so with that, that Spizzichino ride, because it was a little bit more in, it was a little bit more balanced. It wasn't quite as extreme as that dark dry series from Agop. I believe it's from Agop, but dark dry series and it's not as smooth as the a custom you know it's kind of in the middle somewhere what this can do to the sound is it can give you what i like to call like stretching apart the frequencies so that you have you're just creating separation the lows are really low the mids are in a place and the highs are really high so there's separation Hmm. it's it's not unlike when you look at a video that's 4k or you know next to a video that's 360p or yeah. a video that's just kind of grainy, right? It feels the grainy video feels kind of flat. It feels kind of squished. But then yeah. you look at the 4K video and you just see the depth. All of the depth is there. Yeah. And it draws you in more. So symbols are like that. You know, you can create a symbol in a way that it feels very wide sonically. And 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 because of that, you have a clarity on your stick definition. It's not getting muddy. It sits out on top, but you also have more stuff going on underneath. It's kind of that ugly yeah. thing that Spizzichino talked about in that documentary. He likes, and and I would I would rephrase it and call it vibe. It's it's the yeah. vibe that makes you want to play that symbol. And I think that's a very good ex- uh, kind of um, example of that. Looking at like standard definition video versus ultra HD, where. There's plenty of people out there who will literally like maybe like, you know, your mom or your dad, they'll watch like a video that's like 480 and they're P and they're like, it looks fine. Right. They don't care. Right. That could be like, you know, just getting a grabbing a symbol off of the rack. that's like, you know, middle of the road kind of symbol. But then there's people who are passionate about, you know, 8K video or something. Yeah. Right. There's something for everyone. Just and there there's, it's not wrong one way or the other, but uh, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. And it's also to your point, it's also the function. And what you what what do you need it for? So you know, if you took one of my jazzier cymbals and put it with a rock band, it's not going to work. You know, sure. There there's a, a real point to be said that maybe an A custom ping ride is better for your rock gig than yeah. one of my cymbals that I've agonized over for hours. You know, it, yeah. it it really comes down to the function. And so I you know like I really resonate with Spizzichino where when he says. You can find beautiful sounds anywhere. You know, Peisty makes some of the most beautiful sounding symbols I've ever heard. Yeah. They're consistent. They're beautiful. You know, it's not the sound I gravitate towards, um, but it's amazing and it does the job really, really well. So if you need that kind of sound, you're not going to get that kind of sound with a thin, jazzy, wobbly thing. And I like to talk about this a lot on my YouTube channel, like the function of your symbol. What do you need it to do? Oftentimes we hear it behind the kit and we go, wow, this is amazing. But are you thinking about how that symbol sounds 30 feet in front of the kit? Are you thinking about how it sounds translated through mics and through a sound system? Maybe your thin, jazzy, washy, dark ride is not as good as you think it is for your the environment that you're in. Maybe you need yeah. something that's a little bit more of just a straight ahead 460p video yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's just going to be flat, clear, and it's going to cut, you know? Yeah, yeah. But that's the fun part. We get to buy more symbols and exactly yes, <laughs> and have more stuff. But I have a huge collection. <laughs> yes, exactly. We spend all of our money. All right. So your list so far. We'll keep going. We have yes, overall diameter, yes. profile, thickness, taper, yep. topography. Yep. I, I said everything about topography. Basically, the more topography, the more dry, the more choked those the sustain and overtones are. The less topography, the more smooth and and the more um, the more resonant, and the longer the sustain. And then there's a whole middle ground, which I like to play in the middle ground. I don't like the extremes typically. Yeah. I like to find the nuance in the middle ground. So there's a lot of nuance with topography. Um, taper, you know, that's just where that thickness is located. Um, the next is the the bell or the cup, some people say. 
And that's, you know, the shape of the bell. Is it, you know, tall and kind of almost triangular and conical shaped? Or is it wider and lower? Um, that's going to dictate a, a, to a very large degree the sound of your cymbal. Um, the way I like to explain this simply is just take a flat ride. No bell, right? Mm-hmm. What do you get with a flat ride? You get stick definition. Do you have a crash? No, you don't really have a crash with a... You don't have a, a sustaining crash that's very loud with a flat ride. Um, I try to make flat rides that do crash, but but it's different. It's just a different thing. So yeah. You add in a bell. Say it's a really small mini cup bell. All of a sudden, you have stick definition, but all of a sudden, there's more sustain. And the the crash is a little bit more... It's louder and a little bit more present. And then you start to have, you know, say say with a flat ride, you got stick definition and then crashes way down here. With a mini bell, maybe it's more like this, okay? And hmm. then with, you get a, a normal size, standard pressed bell, normal height, normal width. All of a sudden, that sustain and volume of the crash is up here. It's a little bit higher. So, so basically, the bell is giving you, you know, to overgeneralize, it's giving you the volume and the sustain to the crash of the symbol. Like in the simplest terms without go- doing like, I mean, I'm sure you could do a college class on it. Why? Why is the bell affecting the way the sound is working, like spreading like that so much? I would. So, I mean, t- to me, I think I, I don't really know, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Good um, answer. <laughs> but to me, it's it's the the I like to think about like the Liberty Bell. You, you know, how the Liberty Bell is just this massive like chime thing. Crazy. Yeah. And you think about what like if you think about the Liberty Bell, what does it sound like to you? It just, just sounds thick dong. Yes. Like yes. lots of sustain. Lots of sustain. Yeah. And so imagine you have like a, a piece of bronze and you've put the Liberty Bell on it. And you're you're adding in that kind of character to this to the symbol. And that's the extreme. So what if you you take it a little bit lower and a little less crazy shaped? Then you're getting less of that dong kind of <laughs> sound in it. Maybe that's a, there's a better way of saying that. Uh, <laughs> but you get a little less of that. And it's like kind of putting that into the sustain and maybe it's the the separation and the way that um, the the curvature uh, a lot oftentimes symbol Smiths will talk about the having an integrated bell or a separated bell so yeah. that oftentimes has to do with these hard angles and hard curvatures up do you have a, a ah. bell that's really gradual well that bell is kind of morphing into the sound of the symbol itself whereas if the bell the body comes up and then it's a really harsh curvature up into the bell you're going to have separation from that of the bell and the body of the symbol Got so it. i you know that's short, a good explanation short yeah. answer is i don't know that what we just heard was me just pulling that out of my butt and yeah. i do think it, it connects because that's kind of how i think about bells i i think about the separation and the in or the integration i think about the height you know the height and the width really does to say it simply the bigger the bell the louder it's going to be, the more sustain okay. it's going to have. Yeah. I'm, I'm also, which I haven't really done before, since talking to you, more visualizing a stick hit and then sound traveling and the, 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 the you know, direction and the path it's going to kind of find the quickest way out yes. to like dissipate, basically. Yes. And yeah. if it has a quick and easy exit, then it's like it's just going to be heard. You're going to see it going down the horizon. You're going to see it for miles as it's leaving, yeah. right? But if yeah. it's if you've got hills and valleys, you can't see the horizon. You know, you're just you're blocked by the nearest hill. So you're it, it that it's drier. It's it's it kind of just falls off the edge and doesn't sustain very much. And you just have you're left with just the attack. You know, sure. Is that all of them, or did we did we cover density? Density is kind of a, a little bit more of an abstract one, and I don't want it to be something that confuses. People, okay. but I'll so I'll just run over it super quick. Sure. Density can relate to stiffness. So the material itself, when you get a blank, a blank is a completely untensioned piece of bronze. And I like to think of tension or stiffness as I like to use the analogy of a guitar string because you 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 know you tighten that guitar string and the pitch is going up, right? You loosen the guitar string, it pitch is going down, but at a certain point you lose the tension in it yeah. and it flops Tone. yeah, and then it's not going to make a sound, right? So obviously it's a piece of metal. It's going to make a sound, but like 
when you get a blank and you just hit it, you hear attack and then you hear a growly wash that dies super quick. Yeah. It's just a soft, malleable piece of metal. And when you're hammering it into shape, you're also dealing with the density and you're putting in, you're like tuning up the guitar string and, and putting in this stiffness that the material doesn't want to be in. It wants to be in a loose state. And so you're like a guitar string doesn't want to be stretched tight. It wants to be just loose and floppy. So you're forcing it into this tight space, which is going to give it, um, which is what gives it that sustain. The, the, the stiffness, the density, it's all going to give it um, the ability to kind of ring out uh, sure. against its will, you know, as, a, as an element. So yeah, um, yeah. With with well, density and stiffness, you can also talk about the um, like the surface and like what's on the surface. This is kind of a side note: is you know you'll see unlathed symbols. So if you if you look at a brown symbol, right, just make it simple. Brown symbols have the unlathed crust on them, and that's the crust that forms on the bronze when it's in the oven. You pull that thing out, you put it on a lathe, you shave away the crust. You're left with that beautiful golden color. And that you're and you're opening up raw bronze, which has much uh, the the ability to sustain much more. That unlathed crust just makes things dry. So minel is the king of dry. They're the king of just really thin and and u- utilizing an unlathed crust. So it's it's low pitched, dry. It's trashy. It's aggressive. It gets in. It gets out. You can also simulate that via the use of a patina. Whether it's chemical, natural, you can build up grime. You can do clear coats and waxes and things to kind of simulate that. So that's kind gotcha. of a side thing. All yeah. of those things I would I would classify under the mantra of shape. And so if you can kind of just force yourself to dive in a little bit and understand the different elements, you can start to see in the matrix, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like you can start yeah. to see, okay, I, now I understand what's happening why does this symbol sound the way that it does? And why does the symbol I bought that, you know, sounded one way on the recording, why isn't it doing what I wanted it to do when I have it in my drum room? You know, yeah. there's a whole conversation yeah. to be had there, but. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right. So two questions come to mind. First off, just kind of one that's like, like it just popped into my head of like, I remember being somewhere and I've seen these before where there is a certain kind of symbol that I've never played as you're talking about density, where it is so wobbly Mm. And it's so just like it, it, it. There's something to it, and I'm, you know, probably what I'm talking about. What is the deal with that type of symbol? Yeah. So, uh, again, overgeneralizing, and I say I say overgeneralizing a lot because I want to go back to that point of every every shape in a symbol, yeah. every every element affects every other element. So you you have to say one thing, and you have to have a million caveats with. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. put all that to the side. I can take a symbol. I can put it on my lathe and I could I could flip it upside down and put it on my lathe. So I'm I'm facing the the underside of the symbol on my the lathe. bottom. Yep. Yep. I can then take a a blunt metal rounded off rod and I can use pressure. I can press into the bottom of that symbol and I can just relax the whole thing. I'm not cutting away material. Ah. All I'm doing is using pressure. So I pull that symbol off, I hit it, all of a sudden it's a jellyfish. That's exactly right. I was thinking, I didn't explain that right. It is like visibly there's something going on with this symbol that makes it jellyfish is a great, it's just, it looks like a, like a amorphous blob. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's just so wobbly. So that's not lathing. That is just relaxing the metal. It is, it is lathing because, yes, you know, if you, sure, okay. you can cut away material on the bottom and use pressure and kind of re- relax the metal, um, but you can do it without removing any metal, without hammering. So this kind of gets into the point of, you know, when I'm hammering a symbol, if I hammer the bottom, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm doing this with the bottom, right? I'm kind of like, let it's slumping a little bit. I'm kind of de- mm-hmm. detensioning it, de-stiffening it, and it's yeah. kind of slumping. You have to do bottom hammering to get your structure there, but I like to think of it like a tent. So a tent has these like, you know, stilt things in it, yep. and then there's fabric stretched across it. You know, if, if there weren't the stilts on the underside of the symbol, the fabric would just be laying on the ground totally floppy. So you need yeah. structure on the underside of your symbol. But if you want to stiffen a symbol, it's all on the top. So you work the top to stiffen the symbol. So got it. So it's it's you know making a symbol is this is this back and forth top bottom. You're just rocking it into the shape that you want it to have, 
And then you just keep going. If you want it more umbrella shaped, you just keep going. So, and then you can get it to a certain shape. You can let it rest, let the molecules kind of realign. And then you could go in and like I said, use a blunt tool, hit the underside, you know, just like pressure on the underside. And then all of a sudden you can slump it. And I use that actually as an effective tool. If I get a symbol in that just has a crazy hum, that's ugly. Hmm. Sometimes maybe you just need to de- tension the thing on the underside, which will take that hum and it just drops the pitch of the hum way lower. And so then you can kind of blend it into the overall sound. I don't typically like super floppy jellyfish like symbols. There's a balance to be had for sure. It seemed like a, I don't want to say a gimmick, but it was like a look at this, look at how crazy this thing is. And I'm like 15 years later, I'm talking about it now because I was like, that thing was crazy looking. Right. And Hammerax is the, are are you talking about Hammerax? It was a dude at a jazz club and I was watching it and he pulled it out and it was like 26 inches. And I was like, what Ooh, is yeah. going on? But it was huge and floppy and <laughs> yeah. All right. So the next question that I had was what makes you guys different? What makes one person have their own sound, their own style? Uh, it's probably a hard thing to answer, but like what makes someone that what, what's like the difference between everyone? I love that question. Uh, I So what makes your favorite drummer, your favorite drummer versus answer, yeah. versus the other drummer. You know, yeah. it's it's influences, it's life experience, it's the work that the person has done. And, you know, with symbol smithing, just like with music, it's it's the ear. Like I, you know, I, I, I find myself, I don't feel like I'm the most talented person. I don't feel like I'm the best. I don't feel like I have the most technique or whatever. I feel like I have... I just spent a ton of years, a lot of years developing my ear. And so I just let that, my ear guide me and I'm, and I'm looking for sounds. I'm kind of like looking for the sound I have. I've listened to a lot of music. I've listened to a lot of Tony Williams and Elvin Jones. And, and when they play their patterns, the way that symbol sits in the recording and, and how it elevates, like, you know, if it's Elvin, how it elevates John Coltrane's solo that ride that he has does something to kind of come underneath the solo and elevate it to a new place. So I've listened to all that kind of stuff. And so when I'm making symbols, I'm just going off of what I hear and what I want to hear. And it's a process of discovery and curiosity. And, you know, you talk to a lot of musicians, especially guys that, that play improvisational music. That's the mentality they, they take into, into playing. And so, you know, there is, there is the the more performancey kind of technician sort of musician, and those guys are amazing. And there are cymbal smiths that are like that, that just have the most unbelievable sense of technique and prowess, and they know exactly what they're aiming at, and they know how to nail it every time. And yeah. then you have, on the other side, you have this more, maybe artsy is the way to say it, like an, a more artsy approach to, like it's totally a discovery, a journey to discover what is possible. Um, yeah. and you know, for me, it's just my influences, like my, my symbols sound the way they do because of the years that I put into the craft, but also into just listening to music and knowing what I want to hear. Um, I could sit here and rattle off what I love about all the other guys that are my friends that are part of that second wave we talked about, you know, and, and why their symbols speak to me and why I would want one of their symbols over even one of mine because they are better at doing their thing and achieving their sound, Hmm. you know? Yeah. That's to cue up perfectly. I just got to say that you guys are very like, uh, everyone's building everyone up. Like, Mm -hmm. especially from just being at the Chicago drum show, there's no, I'm sure. I mean, there's competition. We're all trying to, you know, everyone's trying to feed their family, but really it's like, a big hang and everyone seems to be supporting everyone. And, and I mean, I've, I've known Nikki moon for years now and, and he, you guys, there's always the same like, uh, respect for other symbol Smiths that I think is just like, I guess it happens with drum builders too, but I, I think <laughs> like the drum community is special subcategory beneath that. The symbol making category is even more special where you guys have your own little like club of like we've we've all worked our way up. We've almost cut our fingers off. We've yeah. we've worked our way through this. And I think you guys are very supportive of, of each other, which is yeah. cool. And and you know, we we take a lot of inspiration from each other. Like Nikki is Nikki is an inspiration of mine. 
watching him develop and his voice grow. Like he's one of the guys that to me is making some of the most amazing symbols I've heard. He's he's his technical prow- prowess to be able to execute a well balanced, beautiful sounding symbol is you know he's he's up there at the very very top, and he's also making really interesting sounds at the same time. So it's like it's not clean and sterile. It's got vibe and it's and it, it's so well executed. So I've I've watched him for years. I've watched Mangiello for years. I've watched Collingwood for years. Craig Lauritsen. You know, all of these guys are my friends now, but they're also um, huge inspirations. And and maybe it's because we're still the 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 movement is still relatively small, even though we are in kind of a renaissance right now of a bunch of new guys coming and coming out and starting to do this. And maybe it's just small enough uh, to where we are just all supporting each other. I don't know if that'll change and it'll become super cutthroat, but um, I think there is a camaraderie in having had gone through the gauntlet of learning how to do it. I, I think when, when people come onto the scene, they're like, I'm a news, I'm a symbol Smith here. I am. I've been doing it for six months. You know, what happens is you, all of the makers kind of just, we kind of sit back and watch for a second. You know, we're not like, we're not like immediately like, all right, you're, you're one of us. We yeah. sit back and watch. And it's like the second we just like, wait, we don't talk bad about people. I, I don't talk bad about any of these guys. Like, yeah, of course, you know, it's, it really, even behind the scenes, it's a very, like, it's a very, uh, welcoming community. Um, but we'll sit back and wait. And it's like, we know everybody's got to go through the gauntlet. Everybody's got to have some failures. Everybody's got to realize that like at the beginning, every symbol you make is like the biggest umbrella ever. And then learning <laughs> yeah. how to learning how to execute and make a, a flat symbol that's lower shaped yeah. is takes years. It it honestly yeah. takes years. And so we wait and then there's there's a sense of like I don't know when it happens or who decides when it happens but there's a sense where when you've kind of hit that point you've proven yourself that you're like you're in it you for the long haul. It's like the community like opens its opens its doors wide open and you're like you're part of it. You yeah. know and 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 the the Chicago Drum Show was like the first time I felt like we were all able to get like a group of us were able to get together and and show what we're doing yeah and it was just it was amazing i'm i'm actually like trying to talk to other drum shows and almost like presenting the same idea of like hey chicago did this it was really awesome do you guys want to yeah. do it too which to explain real quick it was rob cook did a it was like meet the smiths the symbol smiths where it was all day there was uh there was basically every 30 minutes there was another symbol maker being interviewed by steve maxwell jr who was uh, doing a great job. Yeah, it was awesome. So that was that whole thing. And then Sunday, there was a hang up in the second floor of the expo center or whatever, where we could all just kind of talk and hang out. So that's what this is not just some like, oh, they all had different booths and we kind of floated around. It was displayed for everyone to see and hear and share. Paul Francis, everyone yep. was there talking about it. Yeah. yeah, it was awesome. And then and then we also had booths and people were able to and walk around and check out. People stuff did have and, booths. Yeah, yes, yeah. of course. I, that was the first time I got to meet Dave Collingwood in person. He had been, you know, a friend through, you know, the virtual space for years. And, yeah. um, you know, getting to play Matt Nolan's 24 inch ride that he brought. I mean, I was just I was in heaven. Honestly, I was I was kind of just totally geeking out. That was the first yeah. time Sarah and Paul had their royal symbols symbol craftsman thing up yes which you know paul's probably the one to tell to say this but i didn't i never really knew what was up with the brands but it's it's like a zildjian and k zildjian sure you know so it's like it's like their representation or you know dark and dirty sounds clean sounds which i was like okay the only person in the world that can do that is paul yeah and sarah you know what i mean like yeah um he's kind of a like I don't want to say a godfather of all of this, but he he kind of really is because he his situation with moving and going independent. But he he said when we were standing there talking that really this is like a revolution right now of of independent symbol smiths and this is the time. And yeah. to had to have him saying that and be kind of out there um as a great representative of of what everyone is doing because he's very popular but he, but he's also very humble. But I think everyone just likes to hear Paul talk about his journey and yeah. symbols. He has so much experience. Yeah. It's just incredible. Yeah. He had he had the Nefertiti ride in his possession, in yes, his office. For totally. Like six in months. his office. Yeah. He he I I believe he met Elvin. 
I believe. Yeah, for you know, sure. Obviously, he worked on the Bill Stewart dry complex ride. Like he was, yep. he did that with Bill. You know, yep. he's got a wealth of knowledge, and he's one of the guys too that has kind of helped bust open the community vibe with the Indy Symbol Smiths. Because I mean, he was telling me just he was just telling me everything that he wasn't like holding anything back. Like, oh yeah, we did this at Zildjian. This is how we did it. You know, and just giving me you know tips, and I've been able to take little things and go, oh, that's how. You know, they got that yep. kind of patina. Oh, cool. You know, like little exactly. things like that. Just totally free to share, which kind of helps encourage us all to stay humble and stay open, you know, to just yeah. helping each other. It's kind of a rising tide lifts all boats situation exactly. with Paul, especially given that he has such a name recognition and his experience. And like he's sh he's shining a light just by doing it. He's shining a light on what some of the other guys have been doing for, you know, decades and and what the guys you know what this whole movement really is about which is awesome so yeah yeah for sure there's parallels too of what you said about kind of like people say i'm going to do this and i'm going to get into it and you kind of lean back and go all right stick with it you're a youtube guy i mean you've got a big following on youtube you 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 post there and stuff there's it's very similar to that where you're like all right you're new to it give it a year and see if you're still doing it podcasting right. same thing it's like yes. yeah just do 100 episodes and then see if you're Yep. still interested it's the same thing where you just it's all exciting at first but then make it your job yeah and keep going and then keep going after that and then you're in this it pays off when you get to be in the group and and hang out but you yeah. got to earn your stripes and you do and, and yeah some of the best advice i ever heard because i had some real like disappoint real heavy disappointments when i was young in the playing side of things and like I had I got my dream gig at one point was touring the world and traveling and you know I and then I lost it and it was just kind of an interpersonal you know relationship thing and there was no contract and so okay you're out now you were yeah. can have all the dates next year now you're out and Jeez. you know those kinds of things for a young person in your mid 20s at that time I was real fragile you know and and I'm not I'm not saying all people in their mid 20s are fragile I was fragile you know <laughs> and so and I think a lot of us artists, musician types are sensitive people. And, you know, when you're younger, you just don't have the experience to know that that kind of digging your heels in and pushing forward is a really good thing to do. And you will be rewarded. Some of the best advice I got was a guy that uh, was telling my friend like how to be successful in the music industry. And his only thing that he said, he goes, just do it 10 years. Yeah. And, and within that was obviously a world of advice and wisdom. It's like, yeah. do it, commit to it, really do it for 10 years yeah, and you'll succeed. It'll change yes. what it looks like. You know, it won't be what it, you know, what is in your head that won't manifest itself perfectly. It will be, you, you will have made it if you just stick with it. Obviously yes. tons of stuff can happen, but that advice is something I've, I've kept really close and I, and like the YouTube thing, I, I feel like I'm very new at committing to doing the YouTube thing because I, you know, it's, it's hard to post a video that you've, that you shot and you edited and you mixed and you did all that stuff. Yeah. And I'm trying to make all this, all these instruments while and, doing the symbols. Right. Yes. And, yeah. and it's just tough. Uh, but it's that same thing. It's like, okay, if you can just commit to one video, if it's five minutes, if it's 10 minutes, whatever, and you just do it, do it a hundred times. What happens at, at episode number 100? Maybe it's like, oh, wow, I actually have um, this many people watching, you know, not that it's all about the numbers, but it really at the end of the day is like, can we put food on our on our table yes. and are we doing something that we are passionate about and we love? So Yes, and it um, compounds. Everything compounds where you get more viewers, then that's buying, people are buying more symbols and then yes. people are following you more on this and then that's happening because this is happening. It's not just one straight shot. It's yeah. It's multiple. Everything just kind of builds off of off of it. Um, and yeah, but your reputation is important in, in our community. And I think uh, like um, we have said before, everyone seems to be very supportive of everyone. And it's yeah. it's super cool. There's there's just so many cool people. And there's there's like I said, there's too many to name. I mean, I, I got to hang out with like Mike Mangello and Matt Nolan and all and, and um, Nikki Moon and all these guys at the show and you for a little bit. And you had your baby daughter there, which is yeah. a different story. Oh, yeah. Um, which is super cool. You brought your daughter. How, how was that experience having having a baby at the show? That was not a plan. Um, <laughs> it, my, my wife and my daughter were going to stay and we had some like family news come up and it was like, OK, you're just going to come with us and just hang with us and we'll just see how this goes. 
Yeah. And we put my baby in the car for a 14 hour drive and she did great. That's awesome. You know, uh, yeah. a week later, you know, which is kind of now ish, she's just started this, this phase of screaming like a banshee at us constantly. So I'm just happy that like that phase in her development started now and not when yeah. we were in a 14 hour car ride <laughs> going to yes. Chicago. <laughs> well, when you're that uh, young, I mean, what, 13 or 14 months, like a week is like yeah. a pretty big portion of your life. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. So, so those changes happen week by week, but uh, you'll, it's you'll fast. get through it. It's yes. so fast, man. Oh, yeah. It goes fast. So yeah. uh, cool, Tim. Well, why don't we kind of as we wrap up here? I mean, I think we you did a great job covering everything. Um, is there anything you want to share with Maybe the last thing I'll, I'll ask is like, is there any misconceptions about symbols, indie symbol smithing, anything like that, that you hear that you want to like kind of dispel any any rumors like your yeah. top rumor that you think needs to be put to bed? Yeah, I, I would just encourage people to trust their own ears, trust their own eyes and trust their own ears, because if you look at the symbol market today, you see a lot of fancy glitz and glam and marketing campaigns that's meant to to convince you that the symbol they're showing you is is the dream symbol for you. And so it's a lot of it is like tri tricky marketing tactics. It's a lot of it is just using a famous drummer who is an endorser and it's like, "Hey, you want to sound like, you know, Mark Juliana or do you want to sound like Matt Garska? Like th then buy this symbol and you'll sound like Matt Garska." That I don't have any problem with that kind of stuff, but I, my encouragement is like, just you pull yourself back from brand loyalty. You know, and maybe that's selfish to say because I'm you know trying to sell symbols, but really like pull yourself back from brand loyalty. Use your own eyes, trust your own ears, and do a little bit of work to understand the instruments that you want to purchase, and you'll be way better set up. To, to to achieve your goal, you know? Sure. I'm, you know, I I like to tell people in the podcast because I interview other symbol smiths. My I interview my competition. And yeah. my entire goal with that podcast is to get them to talk about their thing and promote their thing. And and it's like, hey, if you want to get a Mangiello symbol, Mangiello has a voice. Mike, Mike has a voice with his symbols. And they're diff it's different than my symbols. So you might want to create a collection of, of symbols that you use on your kit. Maybe you need one of my symbols for a certain sound, but maybe you want a Dave Collingwood, a Craig Lauritsen, and a Mangiello, and that's going to give you the collection of flavors that you need to express yourself on the instrument. So I would love for us you know, to, to step away from the brand loyalty stuff and just start trusting our own ears. And we can trust our ears if we do a little bit of work to understand, you know, the stuff I was talking about, the, the shapes of symbols, kind of what makes a symbol sound the way that it does. I try to put a lot of content like that in my YouTube channel and, you know, little things to think about, like playing techniques and, you know, things that you can look for. And the goal is not so that people only buy my stuff. The goal is that they're equipped to go out and find the thing that they want because I've spent thousands of dollars on symbols that I hated and I just turned around and I sold them. It's it's the it's the age old thing of drummers. We buy, we sell, we buy, we sell, yep. we collect. Things go in our closet, they collect dust. Eventually we remember about them, then we sell them. You know, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I would love for us to just enter an age where the consumer is as informed as possible and can make a really good decision that they feel conf confident about. Yeah. It's a cool ecosystem where like uh, like round sound and these symbol websites and symbol swap where people can like go and try symbols and hear mm -hmm. them and you guys are making them and people are selling them and they're you know, they have examples you can hear online and there's drum shows we can go and hear it and it's just a cool world and I think yeah. it's very neat and it's just like supporting your independent local business. You are supporting independent, uh, not local really, but you're supporting independent artists creating symbols it's very cool i love zildjian too i love sabian i love all these big brands you're allowed to like them all but it's pretty cool when you're you're buying a symbol from like let's say tim or from any of the other guys that that you can you're really making an impact on them with an, that order mm -hmm. where maybe the big guys you know not so much with that one symbol isn't isn't as big of a deal but i know with with the the smaller 
independent guys and girls it really is um so yeah very cool uh yeah. tim why don't you share as we wrap up where people can find you social media all that good stuff yeah so my website is reveriedrums.com i've got my stackering stuff i've got um i've got the timothy roberts symbols i've got a commission form if you want to, to me to make you a custom symbol and then i've got the reverie drums it kind of all lives under that website I've got accounts, social media accounts for all the different brands, and I post. I'm on. I'm on my phone a lot more than I would like to be, but you kind of have to yeah. do that in this day and Me age. Too. Um, my email is tim at reveriedrums.com. That's r e v e r i e d r u m s dot com. Um, I'm also on email a lot, so if you have questions, feel free to ask. I'm. I usually talk with people and and kind of try, especially with commissions. I'm. I'm diving into their playing technique what sticks do they use where do they want to play their symbol like that stuff is all important and that stuff isn't really addressed when you're just going to a big box manufacturer and just clicking buy on a symbol so yeah yeah very cool okay everyone check that out and uh and then do your own homework as well and look online and find all the independent makers um and there's a ton out there so uh, big thank you to first off Sean Meeks for doing the Patreon, you know, supporting the show there. Uh, thanks to Rob Hart for connecting us. Uh, thank you to Gabriel Martinez, GM Designs Symbols, which is another yeah. independent symbol maker. He said he does a lot of in he does all kinds of unique things. You heard an ad earlier in the in the show for him, uh, which he's he is supporting me by <laughs> which helps support the independent symbols. It's just a cool. It's a cool big, loop. Yeah. Big, cool loop. So um, Tim, it's been great to meet you, man. I hope your family's doing great. I hope you guys, you know, uh, you get through the baby phase, yeah. uh, which you're doing fine, I'm sure. So Try. Uh, awesome. So everyone check out Reverie Drums. Uh, go look it up on YouTube. I think that's a great place to start obviously your website but reverie drum co is a really cool uh channel and check it out there so tim yeah. thank you for being here my friend thank you and i'm a big fan of your podcast i actually have listened to many hours of you talk oh, thank so you this it's a it's a big honor <laughs>